to the second question. Here is a 43 year old homeless man is brought to the emergency department intoxicated and slightly agitated and disoriented. He has a past medical history of alcohol abuse and frequent emergency department visits for alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal. He had a recent quarrel in home with his wife. How many times in the casualty we have uh, encountered this sort of history? Physical examination including fundoscopic exam and vital signs are within normal limits. Besides his intoxication and disorientation, laboratory uh, picture is shown below with an ABG taken on room air. Plasma osmolality from the lab is 321 milliosmoles per kilogram. So whenever they give osmolality in an intoxicated individual, always find out the osmolal gap. That's extremely important. So what do you mean by osmolal gap? It's the measured serum osmolality minus calculated serum osmolality. So what is the measured serum osmolality? It's given already, it is 321. And how will you calculate the serum osmolality? The formula for calculating serum osmolality is 2 times the sodium plus blood urine nitrogen by 2.8 plus glucose divided by 18. What is the sodium here? It's 145. So if you multiply by 2, you're going to get somewhere around 290. The glucose is 109. So you have to give a correction factor of uh, glucose divided by 18. So 109 divided by 18, you will get somewhere around 6, I guess. And what is the blood urine nitrogen here? It is 18. So 18 divided by 2.5, that's 2.4, is going to be somewhere around 6 to 7, I guess. So anyways, let us take 7 for that matters. So 290 plus 6 is 296 plus 7 is going to be 303. So the calculated serum osmolality is 303. And there is a gross difference between the measured serum osmolality and the calculated serum osmolality. And the gap is definitely more than 10. In this situation, it's around 18 to 20. So what is causing the gap? Which means something is missing in your calculation which means some substance X is contributing to the serum osmolality and you are failing to count for that. So that substance is very likely to be a toxic alcohol. It could be ethanol or it could be methanol or it could be isopropanol or it could be propylene glycol, something. Uh, even DK sometimes can raise the osmolal gap to some extent technically. Uh, but generally, you know, like when it comes to theory, you don't really consider diabetic ketosis doses here. But uh, when you speak technically, DK also can raise the osmolal gap to some extent, maybe up to 15 or 20. So except tolumin, all the other things technically can raise the osmolal gap. So it could be methanol poisoning or it could be DK or it could be isopropyl alcohol as well. It's very, very unlikely to be a diabetic ketosis doses because the patient is having a glucose of only 109. Plus at the same time, look at the bicarbonate. It's 26. So it's extremely unlikely to be DK. In DK, usually your serum bicarbonate will be definitely less than 18. Maybe less than 15 or even 10. But as per definition, your serum bicarbonate should be uh, less than 18. And as per the definition of DK, your pH should be low as well. So it should be less than 7.3 at least. But here the pH is 7.4. So you can say plenty of reasons why it is not diabetic ketosis. And it's not toluene poisoning. Toluene poisoning usually happens because of glue sniffing. And there is a possibility this guy would have gone for glue sniffing as well. Because he's already uh, having episodes of uh, alcohol intoxication. So why not toluene poisoning? So once again, toluene poisoning will result in a picture that is suggestive of a proximal renal tubular acidosis. So patient should have acidosis. So here the patient is not having acidosis. pH is 7.4 and the patient is having a bicarbonate of 26. So it's unlikely to be toluene poisoning. At the same time, there is no business for toluene to raise the osmolal gap. So raised osmolal gap is not a feature of toluene poisoning. So I can exclude that as well. So that leaves us uh, between methanol poisoning and isopropyl alcohol poisoning. Methanol poisoning will happen because of illicit liquor intake, uh, which is banned in many states in the country right now, but nevertheless, it can happen in certain areas, especially in rural areas, still it is happening where they manufacture illicit liquor in that there could be contamination of methanol. 
anyway so what are things that tells you that it is not methanol poisoning remember methanol poisoning patients will have visual symptoms one of the most important problems that they are going to face in methanol poisoning apart from acute kidney injury is the uh, blindness so toxic amblyopia so this patient is not having any features that are suggestive of visual involve vision involvement so i am going to rule out methanol poisoning as well methanol poisoning is going to produce acidosis metabolic acidosis here the patient's ph is 7.4 and the patient is having a bicarb 26 so it's unlikely to be methanol poisoning so the only possible answer for this question is going to be isopropyl alcohol poisoning that is isopropanol poisoning so where you find isopropanol in petroleum products generally paints paint thinners and sometimes in nail polish thinners so this is the place where you are going to find out this isopropanol isopropanol is an alcohol so it will be metabolized by the same alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme that metabolizes your methanol ethanol ethylene glycol and so on into something called acetone and this acetone is the one that is going to leak into the urine resulting in the production of ketones positivity in the lab report so this patient is having four plus ketones in the urine and the serum ketones is also testing to be positive here you can clearly see that uh, the isopropanol is directly converted to acetone and there is no bicarbonate that is utilized that is the reason why the bicarbonate remains normal and the patient will not have metabolic acidosis plus at the same time patient's ph is also normal in the range of 7.4 so you're not having any form of acidosis because bicarbonate is not utilized here and isopropyl alcohol poisoning can result in significant uh, cns symptoms and it can cause renal failure as well. i'm not going to talk about that but nevertheless it is a very very important thing to understand so this is a classic case of isopropanol poisoning and uh, thereby the right answer for this question is going to be option b so let me think about the question in a different way so let us assume the same alcoholic guy uh, who came with alcoholic seizures and you have used lorazepam for treatment. Now let us assume he came with DTs, that is delirium tremens, and you have used excess dose of lorazepam to treat the delirium tremens and the seizures. So now the patient uh, comes with acidosis, with raised osmolar gap and probably uh, altered mental status. So what do you think about uh, the diagnosis in this situation? So please understand if they give a history of excessive lorazepam use, like uh, what we use in a patient with refractory seizures, like alcoholic seizures or probably delirium tremens. So what you need to think about is propylene glycol intoxication. Because some of the manufacturers of lorazepam use propylene glycol as a vehicle for carrying the drug. So when you give too much of lorazepam, that time you can uh, think about propylene glycol intoxication as well. But propylene glycol intoxication classically will present with HAGMA, high end gap metabolic acidosis. And of course, they will have raised osmolar gap as well. But the picture that is given in this question is not fitting into any of this. So the right answer, of course, for one more time, I can say it is going to be due to isopropyl alcohol intoxication. Subscribe and press the bell icon so you never miss an update from PrepLadder.